So good morning and welcome to this week's episode of the Talent Magnet Inc. Institute podcast. I have the distinct pleasure today to be sitting uh, camera to camera with Alton Fitzgerald White, who may be best known for playing King Mufasa 4,308 times on stage, and also the author of My Pride, Mastering Life's Daily Performances. Alton, welcome to the Talent Magnet Institute podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So you and I had the distinct pleasure of being introduced to one another through Jenny Berg, who leads mm -hmm. the um, Nonprofit Leadership Council, and uh, Jack Fitzgerald, who's on their team. Yeah. And uh, it's a real pleasure here to, uh, to have this connection. Yes. Um, and I'd love the audience to learn a little bit here about your leadership journey. So you happen um, to have grown up here in greater Cincinnati. Yep. And, um, and grew up in the projects in Cincinnati and ended up on the Broadway stage. Uh, could you share with our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, I call it my journey from the projects to the Pride Lands with oh, the Lion King, my most recent uh, Broadway accomplishment. Yeah, I grew up in Walnut Hills, um, right off of Gilbert Avenue. Um, went to Douglas Elementary in Walnut Hills. And I'm the youngest of seven kids. And I had, you know, I was bullied a lot as a kid. You know, I, was, I knew that I was a different kid. I knew that I was artistic. I was very sensitive. Um, I was a budding artist. I didn't have those words to describe it at the time. I loved school, I loved order, and those things weren't terribly popular um, in, in, in public housing. Uh, and as a kid, we just want to fit in. You know, it was really difficult. Uh, being misunderstood because I loved going to school because I loved, I was always accused of being the teacher's pet because I just loved school. Um, home was kind of unpredictable and I didn't know what was going to happen in my home. I uh, had a, a father who suffered from the disease of alcoholism. So that makes life very unpredictable when you walk in the door. That plus dealing with uh, the outside forces in the neighborhood trying to fit in but not finding a way in because I didn't want to be a bad kid. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, so yeah, I, school, I would say that school and the arts really helped to save my life. The order of school, the validation that I got from teachers who really helped me and gave me attention that I craved. Um, and, you know, escaping into my imagination. You know, I was a kid, variety shows were still on TV. And that was a huge escape for me, you know, seeing my favorite performers on television and uh, mimicking their performances and listening, listening to how they spoke and wanting to speak well like they did. And it ran the gamut, you know, from the Motown artists to uh, white artists, men, women. I was just attracted to uh, people who seemed to have a light about them and I wanted to be a part of that. And again, it wasn't terribly popular in, and it was misunderstood in public housing and sometimes at school. So uh, my escape was singing. I didn't know that I could sing. I just loved the sensation of singing. And uh, I joined a church choir because you didn't have to audition. I thought they can't not let me in. But the one requirement was that we had to do a solo. And I remember it took me forever because I thought I would, I never thought I'd have the courage to sing in front of anyone. That morning came, I sang, and the response I got from people was just overwhelming. And I thought, wow, something that I've been, it's obviously a gift. All I have to do is get out of the way of it because it seems to make people happy and I enjoy how it makes me feel. So that was kind of the start of my leadership journey, really owning, um, acknowledging that I, that I was given a gift that people enjoyed and that I enjoyed, uh, learning to get out of the way of it and letting it flow through me and getting on top of it and really learning to ride it and, and use that, that, that power because any, any gift that we're giving, and we're all artists, is a kind of power. You know, learning to use those powers for good, to use those powers to share um, and to and communicate in a different way. So that's kind of, that's really the beginning of my leadership journey. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing. There's so much work out and you and I don't know each other as well yet, but our firm is very involved in early childhood education, mentoring. We yeah. support a lot of the work going on in our region relating to poverty, early childhood, mm, uh, organ organizations like Breakthrough Cincinnati, like yeah. Cincinnati Youth Collaborative, um, Children Inc., um, the YMCA, all of these mm. programs are incredible how much they pull, help pull people out and get them on the path that 
they are most gifted for. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing we hear so much is how education saved my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, you can never get too much knowledge. Um, I feel like the more you know, the more power you, you personally feel. Because there's nothing worse than not knowing. And I think what's worse than that is, is not having the, not being able to ask the question, not being able to ask about what you don't know. You know, so many kids, so many um, black kids, so many young black male kids, and so many men, period, are so afraid to ask what we don't know. Part of us feels like, well, not for all of us, but some of us feel like we should already know the question, especially as men. Like, you know, we're supposed to be powerful and all knowing. You don't know unless you have the courage to ask the question, which feels like a very vulnerable thing, but that leads you to the answer, that leads you to confidence and self validation and leadership, I believe. So it's great to hear that, that you all do that, that important work because. A lot of kids don't have a voice yet. They don't, they, they, they have feelings for what they need, but they don't quite yet know how to communicate it. Mm -hmm. And organizations like those, it's like, like the ones you just mentioned, uh, kind of open the door for that, yeah. Yeah. for them. And that's so important, especially at the beginning of your life, learning how, I would say that, you know, when I, when I speak to kids, I go, you know, to you shy kids, um, many of us are, you know, we're told, oh, wow, she's so cute. Look, she's shy. It's, it's not cute because many of us take that into adulthood and never learn to ask for things that we want and things that we need. Mm -hmm. so I encourage them to exercise courage, you know, raise that hand and, and ask, it's okay to not know. That's the first step in, 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 be, in, in becoming a master at anything. How do I do this? What does that mean? Yeah. Did you have a specific mentor or teacher? I know you were um, accepted into the School for Creative and Performing Arts here in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, did someone in that church choir say, we're going to help you, did, you know, put you under their wing? Was there an individual or family member that really you can look back and say, if it weren't for that person? Yeah. Well, for me, in, when I inquire, it was the instructor. It was, the, it was the pianist, the musical director, who said, you can do this, you can do this. Who, when I, the first time, they went around the choir to do, to give solos, and they got to me, and I said, oh, no, I'm good. And the second time around, she insisted. She goes, no, you have to do this. You can do this. Even if it's terrible, this is part of, this is one of the rules. You have to do this. Yeah. And uh, she stuck with me. And I mean, it was tough, dude, because I, I spent weeks, you know, putting it off, and saying, you know, I, can, I, can I wait to sing after everybody else has left? And she had kids in the choir. She would go, okay, you all have to go to the car so I can spend some time with Alton. I'd literally whisper, I was that frightened. I mean, I've been teased about so many things my whole life that I thought if people find out that I'm trying to sing, even though I love how it feels, it would, I knew it would destroy me. But her patience with me made all the difference in the world. And the next time I came around, uh, to do a solo, I was, I was more prepared and like, yeah, okay, I, I got the validation. People seem to like what I do. I'm enjoying what I do. So that was one, that was a major thing. And then when I got to, I went to People's Junior High in High Park, which is where my academics really soared. Because I was always teased for being the teacher's pet. I went to People's and suddenly I was around other academic kids. I was around, it was, it was a mixed school. It was my first time going to school with, with white and black kids. And it was, it was so cool. It was just like, we never talked about race. It was really about the academics. And that was when I joined the, uh, the choir um, at school. And uh, the teacher there, I waited till the last year of school. She wanted me to apply for performing arts, but I was, I was afraid um, and kind of sabotaged it because I thought it would be too good to be true to be accepted into performing arts. And I waited to the last day of school to go to her and say, you know what, I've changed my mind. It's too late to get into the school. And she was like, are you kidding me? This whole year I've been trying to get you to do it. You went to the last day of school. But she said, you know, give me your phone number. I'll see what I can do. The next morning, um, she called my parents. Um, my mother said, okay, I'll drop you off. And I said, you're not going to come in to the audition with me? She goes, no, this is your dream. The best advice she gave me. This is your dream. Well, some of the best. My mother's given me incredible advice my entire life. Still does up until this morning, even. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, she said, this is your dream. You go get it. 
you go make it happen. She goes, but my, 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 whole, my whole thing is that if your grades slip at all, it's a wrap. But if you can balance your academics with this, with this creative thing that, you, that you're discovering about yourself, make it happen. And those are two major things. And every, every teacher at Performing Arts, because it was such a nurturing environment, it was, uh, it was a great balance of you know, keeping your grades up and practicing the arts because there were times when we'd have rehearsals until 10 o'clock at night. And that teacher that you had to report to at eight o'clock that next morning didn't care. She goes, this is, this is life. So somewhere in between breaks, you need to get that homework done and have it ready the next morning. So that was a great early teaching about balance and passion and uh, prioritizing and discipline. Wow. So no matter what the job and where it lands us at what level, mm. um, there can be an element of grind. Yes. The, the yeah. hard work that we've got to put yeah. in. You yeah. talk about some specific techniques that you've employed over time. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to share that with our listeners tuning in today? Yeah. One of, one of my, the, the biggest thing for me is balance. Balance has become the number one key. Um, because alone, when I'm working a whole lot and traveling a whole lot, it's great, it's fun, but then I know, okay, it's great to have these great sort of working vacations, but, you know, I need to take some non-working vacations just because, just to balance it out. And for all the work that I do, I need to have some downtime, even though it's really hard for creative people to have downtime because we always feel like we should be doing something, especially as a New Yorker. Um, but it's important because once you get burnt out, and even, even like those signs leading toward burnout, that's an indication, that's a key to you on a soul level that mm, something's out of balance. Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, it helps to detach from all the wonderful things because you don't wanna go, oh man, I'm so busy and complain about being busy. You wanna go, great, I'm busy, I'm doing what I love. Let me detach from that and, and try not to um, affect that negatively and take care of, of, of what's missing and find that balance again. So balance has become the number one thing for me. Wow. Yeah, there's so many of our listeners out there that are high performing, high achieving leaders yes. that tune in every week because we're talking about aspects of not just work performance, but how mm -hmm. do we perform well with our relationships that we're yes. surrounded by that yeah. so few of us really lean into. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and then also community and life. How do we bring kind of our best holistic self mm -hmm. into the world we're in, not just the world we're working in? And, That's um, why I, think, I think a lot of it really is, you know, you, I believe that you're only, you can only give as good as you're giving yourself. Hmm. And I say, if you're full, you're taking care of yourself first, then anything you touch, anything you come in contact with is going to get the benefit of what you've already given yourself. As opposed to going, well, I'm running on 50%. Let me give this last 50% I have to this relationship or this job or whatever. That's not, it's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for burnout. It's a recipe for resentment. Hmm. Um, but if you give it to yourself first, and that's kind of, we've kind of been, a lot of us have been taught that that's selfish. Um, but there's really self-care. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tough. It's a tough thing. But, you know, it, it just takes practice. Okay, let me take care of myself first. Let me go do, let me go for that run. Let me go to my that yoga practice. Let me go take that meditative walk. Come back with a clear head. Okay, this is what needs to be done next. But it's about taking care of yourself first. Yeah. Especially for high performing people, because we tend to put ourselves at the bottom of the list. And I'll, get, I'll get to that massage later. I'll get that whatever later. It's like, no, you needed that last week, <laughs> last yeah. year. Right, right. And you talk a lot about gratitude as well. How, how it seems like gratitude really helped keep you humble, mm -hmm. um, helped keep you grounded, helped keep you focused on the amount of performances and practices and hard work that you've had to put into your career. How has gratitude and journaling played into that? Gratitude is, is still plays a tremendous part in my life because, you know, we're all human. I'm definitely human. And everything I just mentioned, you know, I, I am challenged with daily. <laughs> um, but having gratitude at the foundation reminds me that, wow, you know, and, and some of these, some of, some of the things that I'm dealing with are, you know, very serious 
issues. And some of them, most of them are luxury issues. You know, like it's, it, it's, it's, it's a gift to be able to complain about having too much work or being too busy doing what I love to do. And thinking about gratitude reminds me, you know what? Just be grateful that there's this much activity. Mm. It doesn't all have to be done at one time. It kind of like levels my head. Mm. Okay, this is what you asked for. You got it. Now, step back, take a breath. Just be grateful that you got what you asked for and then take care of those things one at a time. It, it keeps my mind, when my mind starts to race and, and, and get overwhelmed with even the wonderful things that are happening, gratitude reminds me, hey, dude, these are, these are good problems to have. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, wow, it's not really a problem. They're just things that I need to kind of reorganize to make sure that I do every one of them well. Oh, you know what? It's okay to get everything I asked for, but I don't have to do everything I, that I, I don't have to do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's the most important to me? So I, I go, well, you know what? Maybe I need to say no to that great thing and exit that really nicely so that if they offer it at another time, then um, I'll be open and ready. So it just kind of like clears my mind and helps me prioritize and uh, having it at the foundation. I think we should all have it at our foundation. I think it would help all of us just to be thankful because nothing is supposed to happen. <laughs> You're like I've done X, Y, and Z, so this is supposed to, life doesn't really work that way. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you, one of the things I'd love to, to dialogue with you about is you mentioned being a shy child. Yeah. And then when I, if any of our listening audience has ever seen the Lion King on Broadway, what, I mean, it is a powerful experience. I'm, I was just looking up the date, um, January 8th through February 2nd, Lion King's going to be here in Broadway, Cincinnati mm -hmm. in 2020. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I already have our tickets, but I've also had the opportunity to see it on Broadway. And mm -hmm. to think of you, you've got such a powerful demeanor and voice and gifting. Um, when did you feel that turn on? Was it just the first time you finally realized that this gives me energy and I'm turning it on? Or how did you build into that powerful role that's led you on Broadway for so many, so many years? You're talking specifically the role of, of Mufasa in the uh, ring? Mufasa, yeah. Um, I feel like, you know, I feel like our, our lives are accumulative. So everything that I've done up to that point, every role I'd ever played, um, whether on Broadway or in regional theater, led me to playing Mufasa. Um, and I, you know, I had an interesting journey with Mufasa. When I, when I first opened the national tour, um, I had a, I struggled with it because I wanted to be on stage more because Mufasa was basically only in the first act and I really struggled with the downtime um, and also the isolation because Mufasa is really isolated from the rest of the cast. Mm -hmm. um, the scenes are really just with young Simba, Sazu. Um, he's, not, he's not in any of the big, really big chorus numbers except for the Circle of Life and mm -hmm. the day with dad when he goes, you know, this will all be, all be yours someday. But he still doesn't have interaction with him. So, you know, did the national tour, uh, went into the Broadway company, left to go do uh, Mr. in the Color Purple, which is a completely opposite character. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to Mufasa, I felt like I'd had some more life experience. I was able to step away from him for a second and then really trust the dialogue. I mean, Mufasa doesn't have a lot to say. It's, it's more, really more about his presence. And you need to feel a sense of his presence even after he's died. Mm -hmm. As even when, when they bring up his name in Act Two, you need to think, of that image. I feel like my life experience helped me to just really sit and trust and not have to really indicate, but just be. Hmm. You know, I think that's one of the great things about being an artist is that we do, if we see our lives as, a, as, as an accumulation, we get to bring everything along with us. Hmm. You know, uh, of course, you know, the things that you don't need, you can, they gotta kind of fall away, but you get to bring all the strengths, all the advantages of your experience to that role or to yeah wherever you, where you are wherever you are in that moment whether it's tv film and i think it's possible for anybody in any field because we all have many most of us have many different jobs in our lifetimes and if we if we see it as an accumulation then we can go yeah i remember when i was you know that one of my first jobs when i had to deal with x y and z yeah i learned that lesson i can apply the lesson to now if we allow ourselves to Sometimes we tend to kind of fragment our lives. Well, I was doing that then, now I'm here. It's like, well, if you allow the flow to happen, 
then you can use everything you've ever been through in the present moment. Boy, what a great leadership lesson there. You know, I, the, to your point, I think so many times we just want you, you try to compartmentalize, yeah. but you are your whole self. So yeah, how do we bring you our you. whole self each and every day and everything yeah. you've learned, experienced, even the, mm -hmm. even sometimes we look back, I know, um, you know, I inter interact with a lot of individuals. I come from a family that had um, challenges with my mom's generation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but she took all of those learnings, her and her siblings did. Mm -hmm. And how do we lead different? How do we love different? How do we yes. care differently? Yeah. And um, boy, what a great lesson versus shying away from what happened to you. Yeah. That and let you lead well in that. Yeah, I believe if you, whatever you've been through, no matter how difficult, you know, we all, we all have our, everybody, nobody's exempt from, you know, some kinds of devastation in their lives. But if you survive it, <laughs> first of all, it's how about like uh, acknowledging gratitude for having survived it. There's one way to go, you know, man, I can't believe that happened to me and, and get stuck in what happened. And it's another thing to, to move through it and go, wow, man, I'm stronger than I thought. Like I survived that and I'm thriving through that. Mm. Then it, it, it's, it has a possibility to become wisdom, which is tremendous. So there's, there's a getting stuck in it. There's a, there's a there's a potential or the, the choice of avoiding it, or there's a choice of moving through it and letting it contribute to your present life and become wisdom and, you know, compassion for when you're dealing with, when you see someone else going through it. I mean, I think compassion is one of the most powerful things there, there is. Um, and to me, compassion doesn't mean that you have to do anything, <laughs> but it just means you have empathy for some, for someone like, wow, I really, I can send positive energy to that other source because I have an idea of what that must be like. Hmm. That's a tremendous thing. Yeah, it's just so powerful. Alton, in your book, My Pride, Mastering Life's Daily Performances, you mention, I'm going to read this quote uh, for our listeners um, who haven't read the book yet, but we're going to provide a link in our show notes so everybody will go out and grab their own copy. Awesome. Um, you say part of what had supported me and allow me to continue to progress in the Lion King for all those years had been learning different ways along my path of finding a balance between my hectic repetitive schedule on the one hand and learning to trust myself enough to allow room for spontaneity and self -nur self nurturing on the other. Mm -hmm. The balance was constantly shifting, causing me to present and be aware of my feelings and my relationships to work and myself. That part struck me so strongly about learning to trust in yourself. And it sounds like I just love to continue to help the, those that are listening is, you know, what do you see as some more of the ultimate benefits of trusting yourself and loving yourself and caring for yourself well, so mm -hmm. that we can care, love and trust others um, yeah. So much of this starts with how we feel about ourselves. Yeah. And, um, and you were in the, you know, you were in the grind, 4,308 yeah. performances. Yeah. That is, that's like Cal Ripken, Iron Man level performance yeah. here. So, Thank you, um, um, you know, share with us just a little bit more about that and trust in yourself. Sure. I just want to correct one little thing you said. Um, you said, be pre be present. But it's really be present. Be present. I don't know what you're yeah. yeah, because that's that's a key thing. Because being present is it can be challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a place where you're not really, if you're not in a particularly uh, happy place in your life, it's tough to be present. Mm -hmm. um, but I think being present is the only way that you can really affect any kind of change to get out to have a different kind of present dealing what dealing with what is right now not what it used to be not what you think it should be but what it is telling yourself your own truth and uh that's why meditation is so important to me you know um and i don't mean just sitting in a in a, in a, in a quiet room my, mo my my favorite meditations are active mm -hmm. cooking is meditation for me um, when i'm in my garden it's meditation for me, taking a beautiful walk, taking a beautiful drive. It's sometimes like blasting music, sometimes rolling down the window and just listening to the wind and seeing trees. That's when my mind is still and I can go, oh, this is how I really feel about things. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes when I'm, I'm, I'm offered an opportunity that may look good, and when I really think about it, when I'm, when I'm meditating, I go, that looks good, but it doesn't really feel good. Mm. And for me, being present is dealing with, is, is being more in touch with how I feel than how things, I think, how, how I think things should be or what things look like. You know, I think an instinct is like, to me, that's, that's, that, that's what I call my God source. That's my connection to my higher power. It's my connection to the universe, how things make me feel. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest benefits of like really just being in the moment, allowing yourselves. And once you make peace with that moment, then, you know, so many things, so many illusions that seem more complicated or more difficult than they really are fade away when you really look at them. It's like you're thinking about the what ifs. Well, this could happen. What if that happens? What if that happens? Most of those things will never, ever happen. Mm. Come back to the present. Come back to gratitude. Oh, you know what? Man, things, things are fine. <laughs> things, things are great. What's the next right thing for me to do in this moment? Mm. Those are, are what I think some of the benefits of, uh, yeah, being present. That's great. I th the um, the comment of of um, I know even my, from my personal experience when I was getting ready to take over my firm as president, mm -hmm. I was working with a executive coach, and she was doing a trim. Her name's Alicia Gerard. She's on our faculty at the Talent Magnet Institute, and um, I remember vividly the moment where she said, "Mike, stop listening to podcasts when you're walking." <laughs> just experience the air that is hitting your face yeah. and the sounds that you're hearing in nature mm -hmm. like that is part of what you're going to have to learn as you move in to this space of hearing and experiencing life and if you're not you're going to make yourself sick right because responsibility yeah. just continues to beget more responsibility yeah, exactly exactly yeah. 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 That's, that's a great point. I, I, I saw that as you were saying that I, I could visualize that. I, I thought of, you know, the average New Yorker who was constantly, you know, on, 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 on their phone or on, got the headphones on trying to blank out the rest of the world. And it's like, you know, I try to, now that I have the time to really just go, let me just not have anything. Let me just sit on the train and people watch. Let me just kind of, let me just be present in this and not avoid people. There's always something to be learned about yourself. You know, you connect with someone or you see someone and, and there's nothing like, you know, making eye, eye contact with someone and they have the courage to smile or nod and, and, and greet you. It's like, wow, that used to be, it used to happen all the time. And now that we're all in our worlds and, and a smile from a stranger can completely change your day. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't want to go around looking for that. But when it happens, that surprise, it's like, whoa. Oh, that's something I want to touch on because you you mentioned that in in the quote you read about uh, surprise. Who doesn't like to be surprised? Most of us love to be surprised. Um, if you're doing the same thing, the same way all the time, yeah, you may get the results that you want, which is a great thing. But how about getting something new? How about getting getting something different? And that's what we all say we want. I want something new. I need a change. I need to shake things up that's so available to us. We don't have to, it doesn't have to come from outside of us. Most of that is, most of those tools that, to make that happen, we already have. Which again, I think it's important to, which why I think it's uh, important to have quiet time, downtime, meditative time, like that person said to you, you know, don't listen to the podcast, just go for that walk. Just listen to the, listen to the birds chirp, listen to, tap into something else that's already there mm -hmm. as opposed to something, you know, put, putting something on it. Yeah. Yeah. And to all of those listening who are running right now, you can finish <laughs> out this episode and then hit pause and put your, there you go. Yes. Yes. After you listen yeah, to this. We yeah. have several leaders who uh, <laughs> are loyal listeners and I always get a little update from a few of them as they're training or as they're running. So, um, yeah. But, uh, but it is important. It's so deeply important that we, especially us that are always performing on some level mm -hmm. um, for work, for life, for fitness, yeah. um, that we need to take some time to relax and find that zone 
mm-hmm. um, where we can have that separation from everything else and just really give to ourselves. Um, from that. And speaking of compassion, you know, I have compassion for how difficult it is. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I'll be very honest with you. When I, when I left the Lion King, because I knew it was time for a life change. I knew that I wanted to serve in other kinds of ways that eight shows a week, the relentlessness of eight shows a week would allow me to do. I had a hard time dealing with, with having so much time off. I was like, man, I'm used to being so busy, mm-hmm. which is why I have compassion, but it just takes practice. Mm-hmm. It takes practice. I've got to learn how to balance out my life. This is what I asked for. Cause we always say, I need a day off. I can't wait for the weekend. Then we fill our weekend week, weekends up with more activity being, you know, staying chronically busy. Um, and even that, even acknowledging, I think it's, there's power in acknowledging that I don't know what to do with free time. Mm. That sounds very like crazy, you know, but it's a real thing. Like when I have this thing that I crave and I, when I get it, I don't know what to do with it. Mm. I just go blank. I feel like I'm not doing anything. Cause so many of us tie being chronically busy into our self-worth. Mm. That's why, you know, it's to practice faith. Like, you know, it's not going to all disappear if I detach from it. Mm. It'll actually be better if I come at if I come at it with a different kind of energy. If I find a, a, a personal life outside of the work, mm. and then that'll I'll be able to approach this thing that I may be burnt out from with a fresh perspective. Mm. Um, yeah, it, again, it takes practice. It takes practice. Yeah. So, Alton, one of the things I'd love to uh, talk about, which we address heavily on the Talent Magnet Institute podcast with a couple different phrases. One is loving the neighbor, yeah. loving thy neighbor. Um, you know, we speak a lot on inclusion and unconscious mm-hmm. bias and diversity and mm-hmm. the importance of diversity being the noun, but inclusion mm-hmm. being the verb, being asked not just to the dance, but to dance. Yeah. And I know that, you know, the Broadway, the big stage, the big apple, um, uses that microphone to help in the world of getting people to see one another uh, for who they are and not judging uh, from a diversity uh, perspective. Um, Can can you share a little bit how has that experience evolved for you being on stage um, and just in your own life experience? How do you see us, you know, where are we getting stuck as a nation, as a culture? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and where are we moving forward um, from your perspective? Well, from a theater perspective, it's, man, it's been, it's, I've seen a tremendous shift, tremendous shift. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first moved to New York back in 1991, um, I came here with Miss Saigon, which was incredible to come to New York mm-hmm. with a Broadway show, mm-hmm. the original company. Um, you know, if there, were, if there was one Black person in the show, it was like, oh my God, there's one of us. And most times it was a woman, because women tend to seem to be less threatening. And then sometimes if there was a, a black male, there would be, it would be a couple. It's like, wow, the two of us. And now to see shows like The Lion King, which is predominantly African-American, to see shows like Hamilton, they casts different minorities. Um, I don't like that word minorities, different ethnicities mm-hmm. in, 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 in lead roles is, is tremendous. We have a show called Ain't Too Proud about the temptations, which is phenomenal. And for me, I have never seen this many black male principals in one show. We have come a long way. And I think, uh, I think a lot of it has, to do, has, ha- has had to do with ignorance. You know, people hire their friends, people hire people that they're comfortable with, people that they know, people that's, that share their experience. And the benefit of stepping out of that and learning about different cultures is that it, enrich- it enriches your life. Yeah. So that's something that you may be afraid of. Once you get to know more about that culture, you kind of go, oh, wow, there's nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to take, you don't have to like everything about somebody else's culture, but running away from it only makes you a coward. That's right. Um, and then nobody benefits because people want to see themselves on stage. People want to see themselves represented. That's why I think, you know, one of the reasons I think Lion King is such a phenomenon. It's a predominantly black cast and they're telling the story that anyone can relate to. And you almost forget that, oh my God, it's, it's mostly black people. And that is set in Africa, you know, all of that. And then it's, but it's not, it's not ethnic specific. It's about humanity. It's about the hero's journey that we all take. We've all been Simba, you know? And it's, I feel like the same way about Hamilton, yeah. 
it doesn't matter so much about their ethnicity. Um, the fact that it's being told through 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 hip hop and rap is powerful, but you, you're hearing it differently. Like, wow, I'm hearing a story told differently. Not only sung, I'm really hearing words spoken to an incredible beat. So I'm sure that's opened up so many people who had who had issues about, oh, I hate rap music, just throwing it all in, in one pile, or hip hop, I don't understand it. Well, guess what? Here it is. And now, and that's exposed other people to go, well, hey, there might be other artists in hip hop I like. Let me just kind of like go to iTunes or whatever and like listen to some people. Let me see who's, who's charting. And like, wow, you know what? I like that story. Mm. That's one of the great things about art is that it can open, open doors, open eyes, open hearts. Um, in terms of the world, I think it's, I think it's that it's very similar things. People are afraid of what they don't know. And because once you do accept something, what comes with that is a responsibility. And I think people are afraid of the responsibility. You know, if, if, if I do op open that door to that, then there's gonna be a whole other set of things that are gonna to have to shift within me to accept it. And it's just easier to just kind of stay in my lane and, and put judgments on that and make everything else bad and just stay here, which is, so people choose to stay ignorant yeah. um, under that umbrella of fear. There's so many things under that fear umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Ignorance is, is, is a, is a um, it's the opposite of a gift you give yourself. You know, it's a terrible, terrible uh, disadvantage that you allow yourself to be in and stay in if you do not go with the time. I mean, life will keep moving, things are going to change, power structures will change, and if you're resistant, then you will be left behind. Yeah. You may have this feeling of power, like, yes, I'm on top of it, I know what's up, but if you're allowing yourself to stay ignorant, you've already lost. Hmm. And when you do decide to turn the corner, there's so much catching up to do. Right. <laughs> Alton, we've had so many topics on um, speakers, experts, and just friends who understand the power of embracing others in a way that a lot, you know, some of our listeners today may need to take a step back and recognize that while not only am I living in a place of ignorance and not leaning in to learn more, mm -hmm. but I have a workforce that I lead that looks very different than me. Yeah. And this is the whole loving thy neighbor and having a conversation with your neighbor and just, I just I really need to understand people. Can I interject something? I'm sorry, because you, yeah. you think of something. And I think it's really important for people who don't have diverse people on their team. Mm. Because, you know, and it may be out of fear, maybe out of so many of these things we may feel, but we never put into words. Mm -hmm. So they never, they're never addressed. But if you have a team of people and you don't have anybody on your team who doesn't look like you. <laughs> and I'm not talking about, like, if you don't have any women on your team, you don't have any ethnic people on your team, then you are missing out on a whole part of the world. And your business is missing out on a whole section of society mm -hmm. um, that can affect you financially and also affect you humanly. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that's, 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 a, that's still another kind of ignorance. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's one thing to go, you know, let me, let me really investigate, uh, learn more about my, the, the diverse team I have, which can only help. I mean, again, we got, we talked early in this conversation about education. That is a form of education. Mm -hmm. You know, you never stop learning and a good leader never stops learning. It never mm -hmm. stops questioning. Um, a good leader isn't someone who just tells people what to do. You know, someone who's fair, who's a good listener. Who can take all? Who can take all these different ideas, and you know, and make a really great decision based on this diverse team? Mm -hmm. So, if you don't have a diverse team, you're going to keep making the same kind of decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the world's going to pass you up, and you're going to miss all of the. Up. And you're going to be. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All of the innovation and the creativity, yeah. and to be yes. frank, all of the warmth and relationships. Um, yes that bonded together. Um, I just am, am in the process. I had just wrapped up a program called Leadership Cincinnati and um, out of Leadership Cincinnati has birthed these courageous conversations mm. and, you know, just getting people in the room who come from all walks of life yeah. to discuss topics. Mm -hmm. To your point, the, um, our classmates who went through kind of the first discussion 
their feedback was that initially I was afraid. I was afraid mm -hmm. to share my thoughts because mm -hmm. I've been raised and grown up a certain way. Mm -hmm. And once we started getting to a point of trust where I could open up and share, I learned so much that I never even thought about. Right. Yeah. And like their minds just expanded right before their own eyes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're leading those on here with the uh, Cincinnati regional USA chamber and leadership Cincinnati um, and as well as the work of the Leadership Council mm -hmm. um, through Jenny Berg and all of her work in our community, let's just have conversations yeah. and yeah. get to know one another. And and we will be blown. You will be blown away by the power, by the joy that's put in your heart just by getting to know people who come from all walks of life yeah. and experiences. Yeah, and that's 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 the kind of surprise I'm talking about. I was talking about earlier, like that's such a great surprise. And that's, that's the reward for having the courage to raise your hand and go, you know, well, let me, let me share this. And then if you keep practicing it, it gets easier. And those feelings, those surprise feelings always come up. I got a chill. I've got so many chills during this conversation. When you, mm -hmm. you talked about, you know, the organizations you're a part of and what they do and what you just said, it's like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's frightening and, and scary. But then when you do it, it's like, whoa, I didn't expect to feel this way. Mm. And had I not spoken up, oh, my God, I would still be back there, mm. way back there. Because it doesn't kind of elevate you. It kind of pushes you forward to find, first of all, to, 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 uh, to use your voice, mm. whether it's to say something or to ask a question. And then suddenly, like, there's this automatic community because somebody's going to go, oh, yeah, somebody's going to nod their head. You're going to go, oh, wow, I'm not the only one. That feeling of, of validation is such a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great point, I think, there as well to those listening, those watching. You're not the only one who, right. if you're thinking, I've never done that, you're not the only one who has never done that. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. And what I say is reach out to those that are involved in our efforts here at the Talent Magnet mm -hmm. Institute, to mm -hmm. authors and leaders like Alton, who want to help people on this yeah. journey. Yeah. And um, the world is so much a better place mm -hmm. from this just behavior of one, being intentional, yep. being very intentional about who's at your dinner table, mm -hmm. who's surrounding your boardroom, who's on your team. Um, being intentional for those that you tend to listen to a little more than others. Mm -hmm. How intentional are you to open that up to all people on your team? Yes. And, um, and in the community and organizations you work mm -hmm. on. Um, so thank you for that call to action, Alton. I think that's a great, great takeaway from this episode. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. And stay courageous. All these things take courage. And it's cur courage. We already have courage. Mm. It's about, you know, getting the things that are blocking it out of the way so they can come forth. So you can ask that question. So you can speak your mind. So you can contribute. So you can investigate. That's great. So what is next for Alton Fitzgerald White? What, what journey do you have yourself on now? Oh, there's so many nexts. Um, I have, I'm loving the variety that my life provides now after doing eight shows a week for so long, which I love doing at that time, it's a blessing and I have tremendous gratitude at my foundation that I'm allowed to share in other ways, share in this way, to really talk about my experience and hopefully enlighten someone or, you know, have that, have that light bulb go off in somebody's mind of like, oh yeah, I know that, I just forgot it. Mm -hmm. um, I have concerts coming up, which is really powerful for me because now I'm able to sing more regularly as Alton, not as Mufasa, not as Cole House and Ragtime, not as Mr. in the Color Purple, but to sing as Alton Fitzgerald White and contribute in that way. So my voice and my phrasing have all changed. Again, I talked earlier about my lives being accumulative. I'm able to take all of my life experience as a, as a human being, as an artist, and 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 put into, into these songs that I choose and deliver it, um, which has been very powerful for me, powerful for me. Um, speaking, which is kind of a new thing for me still, has been probably what I'm most grateful for. I mean, when I talked earlier about, about being, never imagining that I would ever have the courage to sing in front of anybody, 
It was the same way with speaking because I was very shy, because I stuttered as a kid. Um, I still sometimes stutter as an adult. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the fact that I have tapped into a, a part of me that was already there and able to speak and communicate as Alton is something that I'm enjoying discovering. It's something that still frightens me, but you know, you can be afraid and do it anyway. And that's what I do. Um, I have a couple of films that are coming out. I have a, a film that I did with Nicole Kidman called The Goldfinch that's coming out in the fall. A film that I did with Sam Elliott um, called uh, The Man Who Killed Hitler and Then Bigfoot, kind of a sci-fi fantasy. <clears throat> it's doing very well overseas right now. It's, I think last week it was a number one downloaded um, independent film on iTunes. And now it's, it's, I think it's in the top 10 of overall films ever on iTunes. So lots of really wonderful things, you know, coming up. That's great. That's yeah. Great. That's so awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you for this time today. Thank you for your courageous leadership and the life lessons that you're leading out. Uh, <laughs> like. I will offer, Alton, when you're back in Cincinnati, let me know. I'd love to uh, hang out with you and yeah, get a definitely. couple of uh, friends in this community together with you and maybe have dinner. Yes, and, we'll make that happen. Um, love to shake your hand in person. So thank you to our listeners. Yep. Can I hold up my book for a second? Absolutely, please do. And also, I want to say that if you go to my website, this is it. Okay. If you go to my website, um, altonfitzgeraldwhite.com, you can get signed copies of this. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, I will, the posters is included in the price. I will send it, I will write, sign it to whomever you like and send it directly to your home or as a gift to anyone that you'd like to, to gift it to. That's wonderful, Alton. We will provide a link in our show notes to your website. Thank you. Um, I, I may also, uh, you've got some great YouTube videos I'd love to put on the show notes as well. Yeah. So we'll provide that. The TED and, Talk. Uh, yes, please. And your TED Talk. Yeah, the TED Talk Broadway series. Um, so I will do that. And for all of our listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. We can't tell you how thankful we are for this community. And um, we'd love your feedback on this episode. We'd love your comments and questions that you'd love to ask us or Alton. And um, hopefully we've just introduced you to another powerful resource for your life to lead well and reframe success and leadership. So thank you so much for joining us.